now we're in pre presenter mode. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So, oops. <laughs> so today I am going to talk about my research into the Labda myth, which is a myth in the Corinthian uh, mytho history that I think is very interesting and especially is very interesting in regards to what it deals with, which is it deals with a story of a woman with a disability, which isn't something that you usually see in Greek mythology. And there's a couple of reasons why, and I think that in order to get a good sense of why this is an interesting story, we should take a look quickly at some basic overview of what exactly is disabled, uh, disability studies. So in order to do that, we need to sort of define disability, which is, if you've ever looked into this subject, is an incredibly hard thing to do. There's a number of different definitions. The definitions vary from culture to culture, from group to group. The definition that I am using in terms of the modern construct of disability is the one that the UN has published as their official definition of disability for purposes of like political studies and things like that. This definition is by no means completely perfect and is no means inclusive of every single school of thought in regards to disability, but it's the one I've chosen as the easiest way to explain some concepts that I'm going to be talking about, and it's the easiest one I found that is close to perfect as it has, as I've seen. As I said, there is no perfect definition, but the one I have is that a, def a disability is a long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairment, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder a person's full and effective participation in society and on an equal basis with others. This is the official UN definition of this, but when we talk about ancient Greece, it's a lot harder to figure out what their definition of disability would be. Put it simply, we don't know. It varied from city state to city state. It varied from issue to issue. It even varied from culture to culture within that city state. Within the ancient world, there was a number of different definitions of disability. For example, in Israel, which I am by no means an expert on, I know that certain skin conditions were considered a disability, while in places like Greece, there isn't so much of a mention of that. There's also difficulty in deciding which condition is part of a disability and which isn't, because there's a number of different definitions for each kind of disability. And what I mean by that is that lameness, especially, which is what I'm going to mainly be talking about today, as in some sort of injury of the leg, was often given multiple different definitions. So while minor limping might have been considered a disability in other cities, it may have not been in one city. It may have required something more severe. So the ancient construct of disability is incredibly hard to define. But as we're moving along, we're hoping to find maybe a bit of a better way to define it. And as you study the ways that the ancients define disability, two schools of thought generally tend to open up. And these are the Athenian school of thought and the Spartan school of thought. Their constructs sort of play against each other in a way that I find very interesting. And these are by no means the only two constructs that would have existed in ancient Greece, but the problem is that much of our knowledge about the ancient world comes from Athens because they were more prolific writers and preservers, and Athenians tended to write about Spartans because of the rivalry between the two, so we know more about how those two thought about things in comparison to each other than we did about other places. I would like to make a note here that we I am going to be talking about Corinth a lot in here, and we do not have a concrete idea of how Corinth thought about disability, but I feel pretty certain from how we from my research and how we will later see the story of Lab to play out that it was something a bit closer to a middle ground between the Athenian and the Spartan school of thought but we don't have a concrete way of knowing how they would have thought about it. And I feel that it's important to acknowledge that. So the Athenian school of thought on disability tended to revolve around the idea of disability versus proof. And what I mean about that is that a disability is something that has to be proven. It is thought about in terms of a person being unable to participate in society in a fiscally 
appropriate way. They are unable to keep a job. They are unable to earn money. They are unable to support a house. They are unable to support a household. They're unable to serve as a soldier. They are unable to participate in Athenian society as a full citizen in a fiscal sort of way. And the Athenians did have ways to deal with this. A really interesting aspect of this is that the Athenians actually seem to have had an early form of socialized medicine. While it was no means like the socialized medicine we see in places like Canada or in the Nordics, we do know that they had some sort of health fund. Uh, Aristotle speaks about this in one of his discussions. The health fund was available for injured Athenians or Athenians born with disabilities that were able, they were able to access it in order to support themselves and support their families. And we know this because Aristotle wrote of a case where one of his associates had to go to the health fund and prove that he was unable to work. And from what we know about Aristotle's, uh, from what Aristotle writes about this process, it is remarkably similar to the modern day having to go and prove yourself in order to get on disability, say in places like the United States. Aristotle writes that his associate had to go to this health board and show through great detail that he was incapable of work, that he was a young man who was supporting his uh, his older parents while he was working at a job that he wasn't really able to do, but he was through the compassion of his friends was able to earn a little bit of money. He mentions that he is unable to marry and unable to support children, which would have been a red flag for the health board that this man really is incapable of supporting himself. And he would had to prove that he was poor enough to qualify for the health fund, but not so poor as to have become uh, a lower class citizen. So he had to prove that he was not taking absurd amount of money from his rich friends, but he also had to prove that he wasn't so poor to have his citizenship revoked. So it was a balancing game between being disabled but not being too disabled in order to lose everything. And it's a really interesting way of looking at it because we tend not to think of the ancients as having this sort of health fund or large generosity towards others or things like that. Now, the Spartans had a very different idea of disability. The Spartans are well known for their eugenics program, which was a program that every Spartan child would have gone through when they were born. When a baby was born in Sparta, the old men of the uh, ruling body of Sparta would come to the house and would inspect the baby to see if the child had any deformities or disabilities that were evident. And if the child did, they would be taken away and exposed out in the wilds to basically die. And this was the Spartan way of keeping the bodies of their citizens strong. So when I said that the Athenians sort of viewed disability as disability versus proof, Spartans viewed disability as disability versus force. And what I mean by that is that if there was a Spartan who was disabled, instead of dealing with it through proving you had one in order to get aid, like an Athenian would, you had to force yourself through the disability. And we have a number of sources actually talking about disabled Spartan soldiers, which is very interesting. Uh, and I put an example as sort of a as a mirror image to Aristotle's associate is the Spartan king Agelaus. Now Agelaus was born with, funnily enough, lameness in a leg. And while this should have been a cause of death for any other Spartan child, he somehow made it through the eugenics program. It's believed that this was possibly because he was the son of the king, but there's really no evidence there. Perhaps his disability wasn't as severe if it was brought on later in life. We don't really know. But he was preserved and allowed to live and he wound up becoming a king of Sparta and he was known for pushing through his disability at all costs. He was seen in battle, he was known for never fleeing, and he once said something along the lines of that he would rather limp towards battle than run away from it fully able. And it's an interesting dichotomy because while Spartan, dis in theory, Spartan disability shouldn't exist because of the eugenics program, when it does exist, the Spartans seem to view it as something that you must muscle through. It's almost sort of a case of putting up with your pain to endure the 
disability. It's something to be conquered instead of something to live with. Whereas the Athenian way of thinking about it is something to live with rather than to be conquered. And both of these are interesting ways in viewing Labda later on. And as we go through, I hope to uh, show that. Now, speaking of Labda, we can introduce her to our talk. So who was Labda? Labda was the daughter of a Bacchidae. And who are the Bacchidae, you may ask? The Bacchidae were the ruling family of Corinth, who had dominated Corinth in the archaic period for hundreds of years. They were the ruling family. They were the people who turned out the politicians and leaders and rich men of Corinth. And Labda was born into their family sometime in the direct period right before the era of the tyrants. And when Labda was born, she was found to be lame. Now, we don't know the details of her disability. We have some ideas because her name, Labda, is derived from the Greek letter Lambda. If you've ever looked at a Lambda, it sort of looks like a crooked person bending over. So some people believe that she was called that as sort of an homage to her disability of all the cruel things. But whatever it was, it was enough to render her persona non grata in her family. And when this happened, Labda's uh, chances as she grew older, Labda's opportunities as she grew older grew less and less. And when it came, she came of a marrying age, she wound up being unmarriable because the Bacchidae practiced, uh, practiced endogamy, which is a sort of familial incest where they would marry into they would marry cousin to cousin in, to keep things inside the family. And this was order, in order to keep the status and the money and everything that they had earned with inside the, uh, the Bacchidae clan. It's similar to how the Ptolemies would marry Ptol brother to sister in a endogamic way because the motivation is that they don't want in, uh, interlopers coming into the family and taking uh, anything from them. It's important to keep it in the family, to use the, the uh, turn of phrase. It's important to make sure that everything that's earned stays within the family. And it's important that everything that they have, uh, everything out beyond stays with, out of the family. So when Labda comes of age and none of her relatives will marry her, this is a real problem for her. As ancient Greek women, oftentimes they were defined by who they were married and whether or not they were virgins or mothers or old women or widows. Those characteristics were often defining, uh, were defining pieces of their identity. Without being married, Labda doesn't have a real place in society. So what is she to do? And it turns out what she is to do is to marry a young farmer. Labda marries a farmer who is far below her station. In uh, Herodotus's writing, he says that the farmer was a good man and that their marriage seems to have been happy by all uh, everything that can be implied from the writing. There's a number of parts where they speak of the husband being infertile, uh, the labda and him cannot conceive, but when discussions of the conception take place, it's always in terms of the husband, which is very interesting to me, because it implies that the husband seems to be viewing their inability to have children as an issue he is causing rather than her. So it appears that this marriage is somewhat happy between the two of them, even though this man is far below Labda's status. And as the two go on in marriage, they discover that they cannot have children. And as I was saying, and none of, neither of them seem to be sure of why this is. So the husband goes to the Oracle of Delphi and he asks the Oracle what they will do, um, why could they cannot have children. And the Oracle's response is that Labda has already conceived a child and that in her womb, her child will be the rolling rock that will bring down the Bacchidae. And the husband goes home. And then as he leaves Delphi, the a, num a member of the Bacchidae arrives in Delphi to hear another prophecy, but he is completely interrupted by the Oracle and being told roughly the same thing, that Labda has conceived a child, and when this child is born, if this child grows to adulthood, then this child will wind up destroying 
the Bacchiidae. And the Bacchiidae do not like this. And immediately a discussion is had about what to do. And this is brings this is a very common theme within Greek mythology of omens around birth and omens around a lesser father bringing forth a stronger son. There's elements of this in the story of Thetis, who marries the father of uh, who marries the father of Achilles because whoever whatever child she would bear, that child was destined to be greater than the father, and the gods were afraid that if she married a god, they would wind up with this child that would destroy everything. So this sort of child coming from a lesser man and a lesser woman to rise up and destroy is a very common myth within Greek mythology. And likely the Bacchidae were aware of this, and that is why they decided that something must be done about this before it's too late. So a number of months later, the baby is born, and it is a son fulfilling the first part of the prophecy. So what is to be done? The Bakid and I go to the house and they enter the building and they go to Labda and they greet her and they show signs of being the lovely family that no doubt she's always wanted. And they begin speaking to her and they ask to see the baby. So the Baki and I have already decided before this that what they are going to do is that they are going to go and they are going to ask for the baby and then they are going to kill the child. But as they enter the building and Labda brings forth the child, the baby looks at the first assassin and smiles. And that completely derails the plan. The first assassin looks at the baby, decides he cannot kill a child who is smiling at and promptly hands him to the next man. And then the baby smiles at him. It's the same crisis. And they hand this baby around. And there's seven assassins in the room. And the baby goes to seven different hands and gives seven different smiles. And then the entire plan goes to ruin almost immediately. So the men give the baby back to Labda and they leave. They go out into the other room and they wind up talking to each other. And to use a non academic term, they sort of try to psych themselves up. They're trying to hype themselves up into killing this baby they're saying that they have to go back in there and destroy this child because this child is going to destroy them all if they don't no matter how cute and innocent this child seems to be but what they don't realize is that labda is on the other side of the door and she's heard everything and she is terrified it's said that she was trembling and scared and absolutely out of her wits with fear but it wasn't, she wasn't so out of her wits that she couldn't take her moment of action. And this moment of action has fascinated me since the first time I heard this story. Because in this moment of mythology, in this moment of saving, saving the day, it's not a ma- the husband who comes and saves the baby. It's not another man who comes and saves the baby. Labda is the hero of this story, and she is disabled. This is not a story that is usually heard in ancient Greek mythology. We don't know a lot of disabled ancient Greeks. The first person that comes to mind is Hephaestus, and he is a god. So he, of course, his story is going to be told. But we don't know a lot about disability in the ancient world in terms of how people lived with it and how it impacted them on an individual level. And the examples I gave earlier were men. We have almost no evidence of women talking about their own disability and how they deal with it or how they don't deal with it or how they even feel about it. We just do not see women with disability within ancient myth. They are a completely marginalized group, more so even than women. And Alabda is even marginalized further by being the wife of a farmer. She is a poor rural disabled woman who is allowed to be the hero. And she is allowed to be the hero because she takes the baby and she puts him in a cedar chest and shoves it in the back of the room. And when the men come back into the room, they ask her where the baby is. And she looks at them and she says, I don't know. And when they they tear the room apart, they don't look in the cedar chest for some reason and they can't find the baby. So they leave without it. And then Labda immediately hops up to the cedar chest, rescues the baby and takes the baby to be raised outside of Corinth with her husband. And the baby grows and the baby lives and the baby is named uh, Sipiclus because the name means something along the lines of drawn from the chest. It's sort of 
an era of Moses, if you will. So this baby lives and this baby grows and this baby eventually returns to Corinth. And just as the prophecy says, he destroys the Bacchidae. And Siplius is a famous name in Greek uh, history that you may have heard before because he is known to be the first tyrant. And what I mean when I say the first tyrant is that he is the first of the Corinthian men who sort of created the government type of tyranny. And tyranny has a very ugly word, uh, has a very ugly reputation. It's a word that no one particularly likes, but it, in the ancient Greek context, it just means a man who seizes power through unnatural means, which is means that was not democracy or means that was not inheriting power at this point, because Athenian democracy isn't really a thing yet. So this man achieves power in his own by his own merits instead of inheriting from his family, and he is called Tyrannos, which is the Greek word for tyrant. And Siplius becomes the first tyrant of Corinth and winds up creating a bunch of different changes that were for the better in Corinth and winds up getting rid of the corrupt Bacchidae family and sort of cleaning house and creating more of a dynasty for himself based on his own merits than based on his blood which is very interesting that this was all caused due to a disabled woman, because normally in these kinds of stories, we focus more on like, on Greekly, uh, on godly origins or the inheritance of uh, d divine blood or things like that. But instead, the person who causes all of this and the person who is remembered for calling all of this is a disabled woman. And we know that Labda was remembered for all of this, despite not having a bunch of, despite not having a big literary influence due to the Comos dancers. Now, what is a Comos dancer? A Comos dancer is a type of dancing in Corinth that would have been popular during the archaic period. And I put a little archaic pot here of one of them, kind of show you what they would look like. I would like you to take note of the feet because that will be important later. These are dancers that were well known in Corinth. They seem to be sort of cultural parts. We're not sure exactly what they were up to. They show up in a number of different events, such as uh, from everything from drinking parties to funerals to godly, to, uh, godly worship sessions and things like that. But they were a sort of Corinthian specialty, if you will. They show up on a bunch of pots being exhorted from Corinth as if they were almost national symbols, sort of like how if like sort of like the American Eagle on uh, things you would buy in New York City, they become almost like icons of Corinth and of the self for merchandise. And there's a number of debates about what exactly they mean because they're dancing in a very strange way. They would be dancing hobbled over with their feet twisted and they would be sort of lumbering around in a strange way. They're not exactly elegant dancers, but they were popular enough that they became an icon of Corinth in this period. So what exactly caused this and what exactly do they mean? There's a few different ideas. One of them is that it has more religious significance than anything. They could be a homage to Hephaestus, but it, they also more likely could have been a homage to Dionysus, the god of wine and revelries because of the way they're dancing they're sometimes thought to be drunken and that they're sort of in a bacchic frenzy they also could be a homage to fertility gods by the way they're dancing but that seems less likely because there's less of a connection to the clear disability motive that uh, motif that's happening here in uh in the fur uh in the agricultural gods in of the era so what I think it is, I think it is more of a historical meaning. And Zakowski writes about this in her very excellent uh, paper that I cited at the end of this presentation that, and I tend to agree with her school of thought, that these are re references to the lameness of the Cyplicaic uh, dynasty. Because lameness seems to have run in that family tree. There's a number of other tyrants that come after him who are suffering from lameness of the legs or even just being considered to be lame of political status, sort of like a, like the modern term would be lame duck politician. The Greeks seem to think that they were lame in status and lame in action as well as possibly lame in body. So these dancers 
are perhaps a bit of a cynical homage to the supposed lameness of the dynasty. But there's also a possibility that these are meant to be more of an honoring dance than, than a parodic dance. And it's possible that these dancers are meant as a homage to Labda herself. It's entirely possible that these were meant to remember and pay homage to a woman who was marginalized in her early life and suffered greatly, but was remembered enough by the people of Corinth to earn an entire fleet of dancers that became a symbol for the uh, for the city state. So to wrap things up, what are the concepts of disability, both ancient and modern? As we talked about them, they are sort of playing off each other in terms of the Athenian school of thought and the Spartan school of thought. Both of them have differing views with the Athenians tending to take more of a fiscal idea towards it with a sense of how can we support you so you are not a, a drain on us or how can you support yourself and how can we deal with this? They think of disability in terms of cost and coin. While the Spartans tend to think of it in terms of blood and war, they are looking for ideal citizens to fight against each other, and they are looking for people that can power through any disabilities that they may have, and if they cannot, then they cannot be a part of Spartan society. And when you think about these concepts in regards to the Labda story, you see a sort of third option arise, which is very interesting. It is the story of somebody who deals with her own disability, not in terms of fiscal handling or through war, but she simply just exists with her disability, which isn't something that's very common even today in stories. In stories of disability, it's always about how someone triumphed over something or how someone did not triumph over something. But Labda simply is allowed to be the her uh, heroine of this story without really dwelling on her disability. It doesn't hold her back and it doesn't help her. She simply just exists, which is a very interesting sort of story to come out of this period with all of these different concepts of disability harming everyone. And I think what we can learn from this story is that in terms of media today, it's very rare to just see people with disabilities just existing when oftentimes they're turned into either stories to be inspirational or stories to be sort of tragic when in this story labda doesn't labda is not tragic and she's not heroic she simply exists and by existing she winds up being the person that saves an entire city and that's very interesting and here are my works and thank you for listening i hope i have been enjoyable to listen to <laughs>